Uh, this morning I'm reading a passage from Deuteronomy. Uh, these uh, passages in Deuteronomy are, are um, talk a lot about remembering and honoring the past, which is certainly something that is important to our Jewish brother, brothers and sisters. So this morning from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 10 through 12, and then verses 20 through 25, and I'm reading from the New International Version. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build and houses full of all good things that you did not fill and cisterns that you did not dig and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. When your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and grievous, against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all of his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all this commandment before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. May God add wisdom to the reading, hearing, and understanding of these words. <clears throat> Friends, according to my birth certificate, I was born on April 3rd, 1958 in Brazil, Indiana. Where's that, you might ask? I have no idea. Because when I was three years old, my family moved to California. And that's where I call home. That is where I grew up. So even though I was born a Hoosier, I'm really just a California girl. <laughs> I was also the youngest, and still am the youngest, of three daughters. I was the oops child. And my sisters were ages 9 and 13 when I was born. Now you understand why I'm the oops child. And by the time I was 12, it was like I was an only child because my sisters were out of the house. And yes, my sisters would say that I was the spoiled one. My parents by that time were more established, and so they had money to burn on me. So I got to travel overseas several times as a teen. Um, I was given a car when I graduated high school. My sister got a cedar chest. And I could have gone to school at USC, but I chose Cal State Fullerton instead, which turned out to be a really good decision because that's where I met my husband. I was 21 when we got married. Uh, and in the early years of our marriage, we lived in Germany for just one year, um, after which we then settled in Orange County where David, uh, while David was finishing school. In 1983, we moved to Porterville, California in the Central Valley, um, about 60 miles north of Bakersfield, and it was there that we had our two children. Then we moved to Arizona so David could go to school again. <laughs> and while living here, I worked for several organizations until I settled in at the city of Mesa where I worked for 20 years. Then I felt the call, and I became a full-time pastor. And that, in a nutshell, is my life. As I look back on my life, one thing is clear. Virtually every decision that I made or was made on my behalf 
had an impact on who I became. For example, when I was seven years old, an accordion salesman showed up on our doorstep. And I, for the next 14 years, I played the accordion. <laughs> Don't ask me to do it again. And my, my parents, through that process, figured out I was musically inclined. And when they discovered that I could also sing, my dad encouraged me to get a degree in music. And that's when I went to college to get that music degree. And that's when I met my husband. See how that works? Every action has led to something new. And, and even those actions have led to something newer. And all of those things have shaped who I have become. That's not to say that everything I've done has been stellar. No, I've made some bad choices too. Uh, like the time I was caught shoplifting at Disneyland as a teenager. Uh, I'll tell you about that sometime. <clears throat> but you know, it's important for us to remember the past because it helps us see where we have been and also where we ought to be, where we ought to go. It helps us to move forward by reminding us of the values that will guide our actions into the future. Remembering is also biblical. In fact, in many parts of the Bible, they, they involve remembering the past. My Hebrew Bible professor used to call these things uh, recitals because it was in these sections that the authors would recite the events of the past that had shaped the people into who they had become. We heard one of those recitals just a few moments ago from Deuteronomy. And in fact, in the entire book of Deuteronomy, Moses challenges the Hebrews to remember the past, to remember the things that the Lord has done for them, and to share it with their children so that they will never, ever forget. So today, for us here at Song of Life, is a day to remember to remember and honor the history of this church. Because remembering is an important first step for us as we cast our vision into the future. <clears throat> Every Sunday when we come together, we honor and remember what happened in antiquity because it's important to who we are. But it's also important for us to remember and honor the life of this church. We need to know more about where this church has been, how this church got started, so that we can then chart a course for the future and to better understand where God is leading us as a church. So let's get started. On July 1st of 2000, Reverend Candace Lansbury, who is a very good friend of mine, by the way, was appointed to start a new church in the Far East Valley of the Phoenix area. And with the help of some folks from St. Matthew's and Gilbert UMC's, about 35 people came together for a barbecue on November 18th of 2000 at Williams Field. Recalling that event, Pastor Candace wrote, they had hopes and dreams and faith, but no one imagined just how great God's plans for this church would be. We prayed for God to use this church to be a light, a song to the community. We prayed for a new way of being the church that would invite people into an experience of living in faith. But what would this new faith community be called? Well, here's what Pastor Candace shared about that. I went to worship at First Gilbert one week and St. Matthew the next. They were our sister churches. And while praying about a name for the new church, each week they sang the hymn, Joyful, Joyful. And I sensed every time I sang that fourth verse, which ends with the, the triumph song of life, that song of life was the name. So Candace took that to the people and they agreed. So on December, in December of 2000, Song of Life came to be. A new church was in the making. Now, from the very beginning, Song of Life's vision was to encourage God's people to be in active ministry with each other. And Pastor Candace felt that the best way to do that was by recreating the Wesleyan model of small groups. 
So they gathered in small group ministries, uh, worshiping in people's homes, meeting together for worship, study, and caring for one another. These groups then became known as life groups, with the acronym LIFE standing for living in faith to every day. Everyone was expected to be in a life group, and those groups were the foundation upon which the church was, would grow. In time, however, they felt something was missing, and that something was this, corporate worship. So when, the, when Song of Life grew to 12 groups of 10 to 12 people in each group, Pastor Candace decided they should come together for worship. And on Easter Sunday in 2001, 90 people worshiped together as Song of Life Fellowship for the first time. After that, they continued meeting once a month for worship, while the life groups continued meeting weekly, and it worked. But ultimately, they felt they needed more, and so they went to weekly worship starting in Advent of 2001. And the life groups, well, they continued. As the groups got bigger, the larger groups divided in two. And then as the smaller groups received more members and they got bigger, then they would divide in two, which is exactly what John Wesley did back in England during the, the Reformation. And by 2003, with 24 active life groups and 200 per week in worship, Song of Life was ready to grow up. It was ready to become a full-fledged church. And in February of 2003, Song of Life United Methodist Church was chartered. Now, that in itself was an exciting event, but it wasn't the only excitement that year. In September of 2003, James and Sue Sossaman, one of whose family was among the original homesteaders in this area, contacted Pastor Candace and expressed their desire to donate land to the church. This has long been a dream of ours, Mr. Sossaman wrote to Candace. We are lifelong Methodists and we feel that the Lord is guiding us in this decision. To which Pastor Candace replied, it is with gratitude and excitement we accept your gift of land on the corner of Queen Creek and Sossaman Roads. You are truly helping make our dream come true. At the time, Song of Life was meeting at Canyon Rim School in Gilbert, but in response to the Sossaman's generous gift, in December they moved to Power Ranch School, not far from the property being gifted. <coughs> Candace wrote, we are about to enter into a time of dreaming, reaching out, and building as we take the generous gift of property and create a master site plan. Then, 18 months later, in the middle of 2006, Song of Life experienced transition. Pastor Candace was appointed to start a new church in Las Vegas. And Reverend Ron Bartlow was appointed to Song of Life. Now, we all know that change is hard, and pastoral changes are no exception. After all, we just went through that six months ago. But even in transition, Song of Life continued to flourish. They were a warm and welcoming congregation with a contemporary worship that attracted 150 per week. The life groups were thriving, with about 85% of those in worship involved in weekly groups. They had strong, committed, and hard-working leaders, and their they were faithful to their mission every day, living in faith every day. Later that year, the church moved again, this time to Cortina Elementary School, just a few blocks east of the Sossaman Road property. And as one longtime member shared with me, every time they moved, it had an impact on the church. Some would stop coming, new people would come, but you know, even as folks came and went, they, they ha still had a challenge. They were attracting a lot of new people, but the challenge was getting them to stay. And you know, it's a challenge we face every day, 
in our churches. So in 2007, Song of Life asked for help. They contacted the Desert Southwest Conference and asked them to help the church adapt to their community and the changing times. And the conference gave them a lot of ideas on ways to focus their ministry and to make new disciples. Their suggestions were many and varied. And you know, to their credit, the leaders of Song of Life took the conference's ideas to heart. In February of 2008, a traditional worship service was launched to meet the needs of a different demographic here in this community. And that in itself helped to turn the corner. That year, Song of Life brought in 46 new members. They also launched a new food box ministry in partner with Panda Vida and offered three new fellowship opportunities, things I think we ought to do. A barn dance, yes, <laughs> family camp, and also tables of eight, which of course we have going on right now. And they also created a building committee to move forward with their plans to build on this land. And all of these efforts proved to be fruitful. Then the economy tanked. The 2008 recession hit and it hit this area hard. When we gathered for Charge Conference in 2008, Pastor Ron wrote, we had a high degree of anxiety about what the future year might bring. That month was the middle of a tumultuous economic collapse which would have far-reaching impact on our national economy and our individual lives. Times were hard and the future looked grim. But Song of Life and its ministries remained strong. Throughout most of 2009, giving levels were above the previous year, as was average attendance in worship. Even in the midst of chaos, God's providence prevailed. The next few years after that were a time of survival, as it was for many of our churches in this country. And in spite of being a friendly and welcoming congregation, active in missions with two different worship experiences, in spite of being inclusive to all, offering innovative children's and youth ministries, Song of Life continued to be challenged. Active participation in the life groups, which had already dropped off, continued to wane. It wasn't that the life groups had outlived, outlived their usefulness, Rather, the societal and economic and family dynamics contributed to a lack of time and energy for folks to be involved in the life groups. And the desire for a building on this property continued to be at odds with the economic realities of the day. But in spite of all that, Song of Life weathered the storm. And on December 11th of 2011, they celebrated 10 years together as a church. In early 2012, Song of Life made a push toward building. And while they had hoped to be in that building by summer's end, they didn't act actually occupy until almost 18 months later in June of 2013. And by the end of that year, Pastor Ron wrote in his conference report, more than 200 people called Song of Life their faith home. But then in 2014, the church faced yet another challenge. Pastor Ron was appointed to serve a church in Flagstaff. And Reverend Sarah Case was appointed to be your pastor here. As a younger clergy person, with a young family of her own, Sarah focused a lot of her energy on reaching out to the community, encouraging young families to be involved at the church. And as a result, the church did grow in membership and in attendance. She encouraged people to volunteer and to be more active in community events. She even offered some innovative children's ministries like pastor camp and summer family nights. And in 2015, she challenged this church to start a second worship site in Santan Valley, which launched at the end of 2016 to minister to the folks in that community where there was and still is no United Methodist presence. And although that second site was not able to continue, 
Through it, the church developed new connections with people in that area, connections that have led some of them to be actively involved right here in spite of the drive. Under Pastor Sarah's leadership, Song of Life also responded to a desperate need when in 2006, House of Refuge, which offers housing to low-income and homeless folks, uh, families, lost its federal funding, and this church came together and collected $25,000 to give to House of Refuge in order to meet its financial obligations. And since I have been appointed to serve as your pastor, just six months ago, we have launched a new choir, a new handbell choir. We've come together to worship in the park. And by the way, we are going to do that again in the spring. We celebrated a glorious Christmas Eve with over 230 people present. We collected $11,000 to adopt a house at House of Refuge, a ministry I pray will continue year after year. And we collected nearly $1,300 in gift cards to give to Ponda Vida, which serves underprivileged families in this neighborhood, and over $10,000 to give to Jose's Closet through our Christmas Eve offerings. Praise God. And that's not all. The future here looks bright. We are looking at new ways that we can better use our property, ways that we can beautify our church campus to make it more attractive to the community. And we're exploring new avenues for ministries to children and youth. We're considering ways that we can streamline our processes and save a little money in the, in the process. We're experimenting with ways of reaching new people. And I'm prayerfully considering reigniting the life groups, which were such a strong foundation of this church. <laughs> and in a few short years, we will celebrate 20 years together. That's exciting. And I know that's something that I am looking forward to being a part of. And I hope that you are too. You know, much like our own lives, which are full of ups and downs, full of good times and bad times, successes and struggles, Song of Life United Methodist Church has experienced those as well. But friends, we're here, and we're an active and vital congregation serving the spiritual and temporal needs of this community, and we've got a great future ahead a future that we will work to map out next Sunday. But today, we honor the past. We honor and remember how important the people were to shaping who and what this church is and has become. And in the weeks to come, as we look to the future and we go through the process of casting our vision, let us always remember and honor the past the last 18 years of Song of Life. Amen. <laughs>